Okay, so um, I'd like to share with you a little bit of a project I've been working on um, that has to do with flows on, on manifolds and um, in particular how to study the continuous dynamics of a flow using, you know, by simplifying it uh, and turning it into some sort of discrete dynamics. Um, so an overview, what we have is, you know, a flow on a uh, three manifold and by flow, I just mean, you know, you can think of it intuitively. If I start at a point in my three manifold and I flow for some time, I draw out some curve in my manifold. Um, in the smooth context, you can think of these as, you know, you take some, some vector field and you integrate it to get a flow. Um, and what I want to tell you is that starting from certain classes of flows, um, we can get an action of a group, so the fundamental group of the manifold, uh, on some lower dimensional spaces. So these will be, uh, in particular, a circle and the plane. Um, and we can go back and forth between sort of dynamical properties of the flow and properties of these group actions. Um, and one of the reasons this is nice is that really we might want to relate properties of the flow to maybe topo topological or geometric properties of uh, the underlying three manifold, and we can do this by kind of going in any direction around this triangle. Um, all right, so let me start uh, at the end. Uh, and for illustration, let's just take a group. Um, so take your favorite group and ask yourself the question uh, Does gamma act on a circle? Um, and what I mean by action, I, well, maybe I'll put a little plus here, because uh, I really mean a faithful action um, by orientation preserving uh, homeomorphisms. Um, and moreover, if it does act on the circle, let's just vaguely ask uh, how. So with what sort of geometric or dynamical or analytical properties. Um, so. Let's start with a simple example, one of my favorite groups. Let's take this one, two-generator group with the relations that you should all be familiar with. Um, and I'll tell you that this does, in fact, act by orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the circle. But from this presentation, this isn't obvious. Um, but it becomes obvious if we think of this group as the fundamental group of uh, the closed surface of genus 2. Um, the reason for this is that, well, I can take my surface um, and the universal cover of it is the plane. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, did I, did I, um, did I leave some? That used to be your favorite group. Um, so what am I missing here? Oh, right, there are more. OK. Well. This group, OK? <laughs> we all know what it is. Um, all right, I ruined the suspense, sorry. Um, OK, so, so we have our surface. Its universal cover is the plane. And then gamma, our group, acts by deck transformations on this plane. And well, if I put um, a hyperbolic metric on this, so you know, a metric of constant curvature negative 1, I can think of this plane as actually the hyperbolic plane. Um, and this group acts by hyperbolic isometries. And there's a natural way to compactify the hyperbolic plane by adding a circle at infinity. And there's my circle action, right? Um, now, on the other hand, I should give you an example of a group um, that doesn't act on the circle. and. Uh, I won't really tell you what this group is, but uh, let's say it's the fundamental group of the Weeks manifold. Um, so this is the, clo the smallest volume closed hyperbolic 3 manifold. Um, and the fact is that this doesn't have any actions on the circle. And this was proven by Caligari and Dunfield. Um, and the idea is that. Admitting a circle action, if you think about it in the right way, is really a homological condition. 
And sometimes from a presentation of a group, you can just show that it has no circle actions. Um, all right, so that's, that illustrates the meaning of this question here. Does it act on the circle? What about how? Well, um, one thing you might ask is, um, does gamma, so suppose gamma um, acts on the circle. Um, so I can think of it as a group of homeomorphisms of the circle. Is it uh, conjugate a Mobius action? Um, and at the end, well, you can answer this question. Um, so there's a theorem called the convergence group theorem. And the answer to this is yes, if and only if uh, gamma, uh, the, the action is a convergence action. Um, so this is just a, um, a purely dynamical condition. So you can just take the action on the circle, and you can show whether or not it's, it's a convergence action. And if it is, then you know it's conjugate to a Mobius group, meaning as a subgroup of the homeomorphisms of the circle, it's conjugate into you know, PSL2R, acting in the usual way. Um, so this is a theorem with many names attached. So the, it was started by Tukia uh, and Mess. Uh, and then the final um, nail in the coffin comes from uh, Kasson uh, Jungreis. And at the same time, goodbye. Um, OK, so let's get to our actual topic. Um, flows on, on three manifolds. All right, well, let's start with uh, a three manifold, and it'll be closed and hyperbolic. Uh, and let's say we have a flow on this. Well, um, the universal cover of this manifold I can think of as H3. Um, and I can lift the flow to a flow here on the universal cover. Now, for a general flow, my flow lines don't necessarily look nice in hyperbolic space. They may, some of them may not go out to the boundary. Some may kind of accumulate on many points in the boundary. Um, but there's a nice class of flows to think about. And those are the quasi-geodesic flows. I'll just write QG. Um, so a flow is quasi-geodesic if all the flow lines are quasi-geodesic. I won't tell you exactly what that means. but it means they're sort of close enough to geodesics. They're coarsely comparable uh, to geodesics. And if your flow is quasi-geodesic, then um, each of your flow lines up in the universal cover will have well-defined endpoints on the boundary of hyperbolic space. And moreover, those endpoints uh, vary continuously. So I'll draw it as if, you know, if I take two nearby flow lines, their endpoints are pretty close together. Um, uh, you can think of this actually as the defining property of quasi-geodesic flows. So they're, so they're sort of the flows that you can study from infinity I mean, by using the ends of flow lines in the boundary of hyperbolic space. Um, one of the easiest examples of quasi-geodesic flows is, well, we'll go back to surfaces. So I take a surface across the interval, um, and I can build a three-manifold by gluing the top and the bottom by some homeomorphism of the surface. And we know if this homeomorphism is the right kind, if it's pseudo Onosov, then the manifold I, I'll get is hyperbolic. Um, but the point is that if I take what's called the suspension flow, so on this surface cross I, I just take the flow in the vertical direction. Or really, if I take any flow that's sort of transverse to the foliation of this by surfaces, um, this flow will be quasi-geodesic. Um, and the fact that suspension flows are quasi-geodesic um, comes from Cannon and Thurston, the fact that any flow transverse to the the foliation by by surfaces is quasi geodesic comes from um, uh, Ziggy. Now, okay, the main sort of starting point of all this um, is a theorem of Caligari's that tells you that if you start with a quasi geodesic flow on a closed hyperbolic three manifold. And Caligari just constructs an action of the fundamental group of your manifold on a circle, which we call the universal circle. 
Um, so this should seem pretty mysterious. Where is this circle coming from? Where is this action coming from? Um, but for now, let me just tell you um, an application. Well, if I had a quasi-geodesic flow, then I have a circle action. Um, I know that the Weeks manifold has no circle actions. So the Weeks manifold has no quasi-geodesic flows. Um, so here's, uh, we've successfully used this diagram to say something. Um, all right, well, I should tell you where this circle action comes from and what else we can say about it. Um, and I guess I'll draw it over here. Um, maybe I'll go back here. All right, so let's start with our closed hyperbolic 3-manifold and our quasi-geodesic flow. And we look at the universal cover. We lift our flow upstairs. And what we'll do is we'll build the flow space of this flow. Uh, so what I mean, it's the orbit space of the lifted flow is another way to say it. Another way to say it is um, just take We'll call the flow space P, uh, and we'll just take H3, and we'll collapse each flow line in H3 to a point. Um, so I've, written, I've called this P for a good reason, because this is actually homeomorphic to the plane. Uh, and this is a result of Caligari. Really, all you need to show is that this flow space is Hausdorff, and then, well, it's some sort of, it's a Hausdorff 2 manifold. It's obviously simply connected, must be the plane. Um, so I'll draw the plane as maybe the open disk. Um, now each point in this, in this plane uh, really corresponds to a flow line. Um, and we'll just use the properties of this plane to study the flow lines in H3. Now the fundamental group of our three manifold uh, acts on the universal cover by deck transformations, and it takes flow lines to flow lines. So it gives me an action of pi 1 on this flow space, on this plane. Um, now some here, somehow magically here, we're going to get a circle. And you might already guess that that circle is somehow going to compactify this plane. Uh, so in order to do this, well, let's take a point at infinity. Um, and let's look at all of the flow lines that are asymptotic to this point in the forward direction. I can think of that as a subset of this plane of the flow space. And um, the, this, pre this, this set of, of flow lines that may be disconnected. It may, it's hard to draw something that's not locally connected, but it, they may not be locally connected, locally path connected. But um, each component of this red thing turns out is unbounded. Um, so if I you know, look at all the different points on the boundary of H3, and I look at um, all of these you know, corresponding sets, they fill up my plane. Uh, and we'll call each one of these uh, a positive leaf. Um, and the set of all positive leaves we'll call D plus, the positive decomposition. Um, similarly, if I look at sets of flow lines that are asymptotic to a single point in the backwards direction, um, I get another kind of decomposition of the plane, d minus. Um, and the fact is that this data, these two unbounded decompositions that intersect sort of compactly, that's another little property of these, they give you a natural compactification of this plane into the closed disk. Um, you sort of just add in points for the ends of these kind of positive and negative leaves. Now, the fundamental group acts over here, and that action extends to the circle. So at the end, we have an action on the plane. Uh, and that's, that's the construction of the action. Um, so I have, I guess, a minute. Um, and let me tell you just some of the uses for this. Well, the main use is, or one of the main uses, um, is in finding closed orbits. 
So let's say we have an element of the fundamental group, and it acts on this um, compacted, uh, it acts on this plane uh, with a fixed point. Well, this means so in in H three that means there's a flow line and a deck transformation preserving that flow line. So that means there's a closed orbit. Uh, in fact, in that free homotopy class. Um, so a silly um, way to find closed orbits if, is if I have an element of the fundamental group and it acts on this universal circle without fixed points, then, well, the universal circle is the boundary of this disk. Um, so this, by Brouwer's fixed point theorem, this means that there's a fixed point in the plane, which means that there's a closed orbit. Uh, and I guess I'm out of time. Uh, but actually, you can say in general that any quasi-geodesic flow on a closed hyperbolic manifold has closed orbits. Um, you have to throw in some more stuff, some geometry, and um, sort of compare these, these leaves. to. Th so at the end, the flow kind of contracts and expands these leaves. And you use some mixture of dynamics and group actions to get that uh, quasi-geodesic flows have closed orbits. <laughs>